All right, I guess we're ready. Welcome everyone to another Quantum Matter Seminar. It's my pleasure today to have Achim Roche from the University of Cologne in Germany, who's going to be uh, attending, well, giving his talk virtually. Unfortunately, we cannot bring him over. And um, he's gonna be talking about magnets out of equilibrium. And uh, Achim, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good. So I hope uh, that uh, that you'll enjoy our story on driven magnets, so magnets out of equilibrium. And as you'll see, uh, it will be a, a story. Um, uh, the, the general idea uh, will be that we consider uh, to pump Goldston modes and see what happens in various magnetic systems. So the work I present uh, has really mainly been done by uh, Nina, uh, which you see here. Uh, so um, uh, plus some some contributions from other parts, people of from my group. But uh, but all what I'm the main part I'm presenting is Nina's work. So let me start uh, with a general question, namely, can we build some small machines using from quantum net matter? And why do we want to know? Well, I, I, my my personal motivation for that is maybe we can use these small machines. Uh, to explore physical mechanism and fundamental concepts. But uh, obviously uh, the idea behind is also perhaps we can use that to create also something useful. So let's look at one of uh, these machines and, and one of the oldest uh, machines known to us, which is Archimedean screw. Uh, as you know, Archimedes was a mathematician, physicist, engineer, uh, and, and he actually invented uh, the, the Archimedean screw uh, to train uh, ships, and uh, and we want to use uh, this principle also now for uh, for magnet. Now um, let's first think what is actually the essence behind the operation of a screw, and the uh, and the screw principle, if you like, um, is that there is a link between two different uh, types of motion, namely rotation and translation. Yeah, when I put a screw into the wall, then I use rotation and, and transform the rotation uh, into a translation. So um, now uh, to use this principle, obviously we need some type of uh, screw and our screw uh, will be the helical phase of a chiral magnet. So what is a helical phase? So it's something very simple. It's just a phase uh, where the, uh, when you move along one direction, the magnetization of some magnet uh, rotates uh, smoothly. And uh, more precisely, uh, th this structure realizes something which, which is realized by any screw, namely that there's a link of rotations on one side and translations, namely whether you say now this, whether I say I do a translational motion of this type of, of helix or rotation, that's actually the same operation for the system. Uh, and, and the, uh, and, and, Microscopically, uh, rotation and translation are really locked uh, by spin orbit interaction. This is, as we'll see in a second. Good. Now, do we have materials uh, which, this, uh, which, which have such a helical magnetic state? And the answer is there are tons and tons of materials. So more than 100 different systems. And you can get them in different uh, sizes and forms. So you can have helices which have a pitch which is less than a nanometer and they can have pitches of, of micrometer size. Uh, you, you have metals, insulators, semiconductors, you name it. Uh, you find this at room temperature, at low temperature. And, and these systems have been intensively uh, studied in the last uh, one or two decades, mainly not because people were interested in this uh, helical state, but, but these systems also typically host uh, magnetic skirmion phases. These are, I'm sure you have seen one or the other skirmion uh, already before. These are these these topological textures, uh, which, which, are, which it's just also the reason why we were originally looking in these systems. Good. And uh, these uh, these systems can, for example, uh, be realized by taking any cubic ferromagnet, but which lacks uh, inversion symmetry. And the most famous uh, examples of such systems is manganese silicide, uh, which is a very clean metal. And that's where, where originally uh, the magnetic experiments have been discovered. And uh, copper silene oxide, 
which is an insulating compound showing the same type of skirmion and helical phases. Good. Uh, so what is the theory uh, for such a system? And it's actually uh, very simple. What you do is you start from a theory of a ferromagnet. So here I'm writing down a nonlinear sigma model describing just the distortion of a ferromagnet. But then if you lack inversion symmetry um, in such a cubic system, then uh, there, are, there are spin orbit coupling. And that spin orbit coupling induces a term with a linear uh, gradient uh, uh, by chaloshinsky moria interactions. So this term is called chaloshinsky moria interactions. And now importantly, there's a competition of this linear gradient and the quadratic gradient of the ferromagnet. And the linear gradient always wins, even when this D is very small. And the result is that instead of getting a ferromagnetic state, uh, you get a twisted magnetic structure where, this, uh, where you get this uh, magnetization slowly uh, rotating in space. Now, what we want to do uh, with these systems is you want to drive it um, out of equilibrium. And uh, we do this uh, by a, a time-dependent uh, magnetic field. Now, experimentally, this is realized. So we'll talk about gigahertz frequencies, and, 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 and you usually do a strip line on your sample and, and apply microwave radiation to your system. So that's how you do it experimentally. Good. Uh, so now our job uh, is to find out what happens in with the helix when I apply uh, this oscillating magnetic field. And we want to make our life simple, and we just assume that this oscillating field is very small. Um, and, and to get the dynamics, uh, I should have said uh, we, we solve the lando lifshitz gilbert equation, which is just the usual equation of motion of a spin processing in an effective magnetic field coming from this free energy. Uh, and we add here also some damping, phenomenological damping term uh, describing some net friction in the system, which may come because there are phonons, electrons, or whatever, degrees, other degrees of freedom in the system. Good. Now let's go and let's just try to solve this problem as far as possible analytically. So here's our uh, time-dependent magnetic field, and we do perturbation theory in this amplitude of the oscillating field. Um, and we first start in zero sort of perturbation theory, so no perturbation. And there, as I mentioned, uh, we just get a simple uh, helical state. Uh, the formula is given here, the rotation, uh, the magnetization rotates slowly in set direction in the example I've given here. Uh, so it's called conical because there's also a finite small set component, which is not so important for the following. Good. Next step um, is to go to linear order. In the magnetic field. And that has been widely studied. This is what we call linear response theory. And it's clear what we get when we apply an oscillating field. We get an oscillating magnetization, oscillating with the same frequency. And that has been also investigated uh, experimentally. So there are tons of microwave uh, experiments. So this this short, for example, a plot of microwave absorption. And, uh, and what you see here. Uh, for example, is that there are, uh, so, so the blue thing is the conical phase, which we are discussing, and you see there are two modes, and um, yeah, and, and to explain them, you have to understand what, what dipole-dipole interactions are doing in the system, but that's uh, that has been all worked out, but, but we'll see these two modes later also, so maybe you remember them. But that's kind of uh, uh, linear response and boring, uh, but the fun starts in second order. So when we go to second order, then obviously we get, again, some boring result response at frequency two omega. But our focus is that also something would ha happens at frequency zero. Yeah? Omega minus omega gives zero. So to second order, there's also a, uh, we get a zero frequency response. And at zero frequency, our system holds Goldstone modes. And uh, so we can hope that to, to second order, we can activate and, and pump uh, into these Goldstone modes. So let's see how that goes. So, so let me actually sketch to you the actual calculation. So, so one way to do it is that you uh, write your spins in terms of uh, two angles. So these are classical spins, two angles, theta and phi, and you just do this order by order 
uh, in the in perturbation theory in the magnetic field, and then you you plug this into the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, and, uh, and and the helix is so simple that you can do this fully uh, analytically, even in the presence of of long range dipole dipole interaction. But to show off that that we can really do this, here's a formula for the resonance frequencies which you have just shown. There's a long formula depending on the sample shape, this this and x and y and z and dipole dipole interaction. But it's something you can actually easily um, calculate. From now on, I will mainly suppress in the formulas the dipole interaction because they just make formulas ugly. So here's this equation you have to solve to quadratic order. Now without dipole dipole interaction, and you get some equation. Um, then you solve this equation, and how do you do that? Well, usually you would just do a Fourier transformation. So uh, let's do that. And then what you find out is that you simply don't find a solution for the uh, for the Goldstone mode. Uh, there seems to be a contradiction of these equations. So what's going on? Well, the answer is uh, what happens and what you can't capture by a, a uh, by this uh, Fourier transformation is that this the angle uh, describing the Goldstone mode of the system grows linearly uh, in time. That's not an instability of the system, but but I just get a, a continuous motion um, of the uh, Goldstone mode. And in our case, this Goldstone mode is the screw-like motion um, of our helix. So here's a little bit um, of a simulation what happens. So, so this is our uh, magnetic order. And this rapid oscillations, they come from the driving magnetic field. And then you see, uh, as a consequence of this driving, we get a net uh, circular uh, motion of our spins. And that is just this Archimedean screw, which is rotating. And, and, the, and the rotation frequency of this Archimedean screw for reasonable parameters, that's in the megahertz regime, while the driving uh, is with gigahertz. So, so roughly every thousand uh, oscillations of your applied magnetic field, uh, you get a rotation of these helix. Later, I will try to convince you that these are very big effects, actually. But, and, and maybe uh, to, to, uh, to, to show that, that we really understand the system, um, the, the dots here are, are simulations. So some numerics uh, calculating this, this time dependence of, of the magnetic structure. Um, and, and the solid line is, is a fully analytical calculation of, of this effect. And you see there's a perfect match uh, between the two. Good. So what uh, have we achieved? Uh, we found indeed an Archimedean screw-like solution. So the, uh, the helix starts to rotate. And, and the basic physics is that to second order in perturbation theory, we get a response at omega equals zero, uh, which activates the Goldstone modes and induces a translational motion. But now comes uh, two questions. Question one is how stable is that? And the second one is how useful is that? So let's start uh, from the uh, stability question. So this was perturbation theory, but how stable is that? And uh, so, so that we can start by looking at numerics. So I, I show here now just the angle of a single spin uh, as function of time. And uh, we look what happens for three different amplitudes of the oscillating fields. Now, first we look at the smallest amplitudes, that's this blue curve, and there, uh, you see, we see some steady oscillations and a slow increase um, of the of the average angle. So this is our Archimedean screw-like uh, motion. Yeah. Then uh, we increase the amplitude, and uh, and then you see there is suddenly a second frequency uh, showing up. And so, so this was the Archimedean screw solution. Now we have uh, a second frequency showing up. So if you want to express this in fancy words, what we have here is a, is a time quasi crystal. So time crystal means uh, the translation symmetry is spontaneously uh, broken. And this happens in an incommensurate way. So the, uh, so the, the oscillation, the, the Emerging oscillation frequencies incommensurate to the initial frequency. So it's a quasi crystal. 
Um, yeah, so that's the state which we get. And then when we drive stronger, then things uh, end up into chaos. Now, it turns out that this numerics is not really uh, reliable. Uh, it actually depends strongly on the size of the simulated regions. So let's try to understand what we see here analytically. And, and there's also some generic general lesson to learn here. By the way, if you have any questions, please just unmute and interrupt me. So I, I would be very happy by any interruptions. It gives more life a feeling uh, to the talk. Good. Uh, so question was, can we do this uh, analytically? So what does it mean to do this analytically? What we want to do is a stability analysis of this Archimedean screw solution. And so what we have to do is uh, spin wave theory. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and we now need a, a Floquet version of that, taking into account that we have a vertically uh, driven system. And uh, what I first are doing is I show you the Floquet spectrum for the unperturbed system. Yeah? So without any oscillating magnetic field, but anticipating that in the driven system, energy is only defined, conserve modulo, uh, the driving frequency, I now show you the Bogolubov spectrum uh, model law omega, uh, which is two in this example, uh, in, in this dimensionless parameter I, I'm showing you here. And uh, what you uh, should see uh, is, uh, is, is one major thing, namely that there are, uh, that there are various crossings uh, in this Bogolubov spectrum. And that came from this backfolding um, in, in this Floquet uh, zone. And, and, and now we, the interesting part is what happens at these crossings. And, and physics-wise, what does such a crossing describe is a, is a resonant process. Namely, uh, you have, let's say, you have your initial spin waves of two different spin wave bands, let's say I and J. And, uh, and they come now in resonance with driving frequency at a certain value of momentum and a certain energy. Now we have to take into account these modes are damped. Yeah, so the, 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 the damping rate of these modes is shown in the uh, plot below. So, so when I drive the system with a very small amplitude, nothing will happen. But uh, when I increase the amplitude, something will happen. Yeah? And, and this is now for a kind of larger amplitude. And we have here this, this resonant point and at this resonance, now I get, I pump into the system, so I get anti-damping. And if this anti-damping is sufficiently strong, then, then the decay rate changes sign and I go from a stable case to an unstable case. So this is what, the, so, so I, I show this here for a specific example, but it's a very general lesson which you should see in any bosonic system, which you apparently try if you, you find similar phenomenon. Good. So now you can look where in where in momentum space you get the leading instability. So you look at the two or three dimensional momentum space, and, and then you identify the k point and the frequency where you get the linear instability. And this actually precisely describes you the, at which point you get the onset um, of the of this time crystal formation and also the momentum and the frequency of this unstable mode. Uh, determines the frequency of this uh, of this time quasi crystal and and the momentum uh, pattern which uh, comes out. Uh, so um, what we can do is when we look at this screw frequencies as function of driving amplitude, we first get the quadratic behavior from perturbation theory, and then we hit the point uh, where the where the um, where the uh, time crystal is formed, and then uh, something else happens, uh, and and we can't what what happens precisely we can't calculate, but we at least see that that there's an instability, and that and at what frequency momentum the system gets in, unstable. So maybe uh, I can yeah, we can take a, a slightly uh, closer look. Um, maybe I, I skip that part. Yeah, so you can now study more concretely how this transition to chaos happens. But let me skip that part. Good. So let's uh, let's say what type of lessons uh, we have learned. So we ask now. I take a generic system. It's not so important that it's a magnet. It's not so important 
what precise system we have. But what is important is that we could discuss a system with goldstone molds. And, um, and what we, and so kind of for any system which have a goldstone mold, and if you drive the system with sufficiently low symmetries, uh, then uh, you can expect that you activate the goldstone modes. And in our case, uh, this leads to this screw like motion of the helix. And the screw, and as this happens in second order perturbation theory, uh, things will start to move uh, proportional to the amplitude of the applied field squared. Maybe I should mention enemy will be pinning for that, but it will be discussed later. Okay, so that's the very basic physics. Small ampli you drive any bosonic system. The first interesting thing will happen is that you activate the Goldstone mode. The second interesting thing which happen when, when you now increase the amplitude is that you generically, again, if it's not proved by some symmetries, you'll have a uh, you, there will be a resonant condition for the creation of now in our system of Magnum pairs or some other bosonic uh, situations. So, um, and, and, and this will typically trigger a Magnum laser. Uh, so that's this time crystal, which I, I've shown you before. You can also view this as a laser where this, uh, where this instable Magnum mode is now uh, this now yeah, gets occupied and it gets a final expectation value, and this leads to this newly oscillating state. Uh, and whether this happens or not, that depends a lot on how much magnum damping you have, uh, because there's a competition between between pumping of the system and, and damping. And, and obviously, to fully understand that, you have to think about magnum magnum interactions and so on. But, but this generic mechanism will kind of always happen. And if you drive stronger, then you can get uh, also um, the chaos, chaotic like solutions. Okay. Now let's go back uh, to good old Archimedes. So we said we want to build a machine. Uh, and so, question is now we have a pump. So, uh, uh, we, so can we pump something? Yeah? And obviously, Obvious candidates are charge, heat, and spin, and uh, and the simplest measure is charge. So let's go for charge. So what do we want to do? Uh, we want to use take our time dependent helical uh, state that's encoded here in this n of r and t, and we want to couple it to electrons. Uh, and and it's not so important what type of uh, model we use for that. Uh, besides one thing, we want to take into account uh, spin orbit interactions of the electrons. And uh, we have also to think seriously about the effect of disorder. So let's try uh, to solve this case. Uh, and the first case uh, is very simple. We go for the clean limit. Uh, there's uh, no disorder. Uh, let's ignore umklapp scattering from the atomic lattice um, also. And then it's very easy uh, to solve this problem. Namely, we just go to the co-moving system, which moves together with the helix, and then um, the uh, and then we get a current, which is obviously uh, just proportional uh, to the uh, screwing velocity of the helix, which is given by the frequency in which this EDC is was rotating multiplied with the pitch um, of the helix. Uh, and, and 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 we'll see later this leads to gigantic currents. Um, but this is the clean limit, uh, which means, in other words, is not realistic. Um, and and now we have to work on the uh, dirty limit. Now, for this, we should better not go to a co-moving frame of reference because we don't want to track um, moving uh, disorder potential or something like that. Uh, so what we instead do. Um, is, is we do a standard trick when you have such a uh, when you have a magnet and, and fermions you go uh, you choose your spin condensation axis of of electrons always parallel to the local magnetization so you make a change of frame of reference and then it turns out everything uh, becomes time independent but with one exception namely the spin orbit interaction now obtains a time dependence this time dependence is now responsible 
for pumping the electronic system. Yeah? So we have the spin, the magnet coupled to electrons. And, and now we said in this frame of reference, the electronic system is pumped uh, because in this co-moving frame of reference, the spin orbit interaction becomes time dependent. Yeah, and then you can do some straightforward second order Keldish perturbation theory uh, in this weak oscillating uh, spin orbit uh, coupling. And then um, and if you ignore some vertex correction issues, uh, this is a very simple calculation, even in the presence of disorder. And you can just calculate uh, the current. Yeah? And here's the result. So this is the electronic current uh, for a given driven helix as function of the disorder strength. So, so uh, clean system is on the uh, right side, dirty system is on the left, uh, short electron uh, lifetime. Then you expect what, then you get what you expect. Namely, the dirtier the system, the weaker the current, um, and the cleaner the system, uh, yeah, the, the larger the current. And, and we can leave our calculation in a certain regime. And now we can actually think about, um, we can now use this to, to estimate what happens in a real material, like favorite material in this uh, for, the, for these uh, type of systems, manganese silicide, which comes, uh, which is actually very clean. So you have mean free path of, of 1,000 angstroms at, at, uh, at low temperature. So we can just see what happens for reasonable parameters. Good. So we said a typical frequency for this uh, school-like motion is a megahertz pitch of the helix is 200 angstrom, which means that, that I get a typical uh, velocity of, of our Archimedean screw moving with 20 millimeter per second. Yeah. Now, um, the first thing uh, you have to ask is, will this thing now really move or will it be pinned by uh, disorder? And um, yeah, and, and, and that's not easy to estimate analytically, but what we can use is we can, you, we, we, we have lot, learned uh, previously in, uh, a lot on, on pinning physics of, of similar magnetic textures Textures varying on, on similar length scales by studying the depending of magnetic skirmions in magnetic sealed size. So these are these topological uh, textures. And from those, we know that, that a kind of typical velocity of skirmions, which leads to depending uh, of skirmions at least, is, is 0.2 millimeter per second, which is two orders of magnitude smaller than, than, than the velocity we are having here. But the pinning physics is very similar. So uh, I think there's very good reason to say we can uh, that pinning will not be a major obstacle. We'll, we'll later have a pinning story which kind of invalidates this a little bit, but at least that looks uh, very good. So pinning is most likely not a problem. And now we can just plug in the numbers and see what currents we get. And uh, we actually get uh, giant currents, so like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, if you're very, very conser conservative with your estimates, amperes per uh, square meter, so uh, which is easily measurable. So when you have such a large current and, and, and you can just take a finite system, then the voltage will build up, measure the voltage, and that should be a, a big effect. But uh, I, I should say that that uh, there have been some tries to do that experiment, but up to now it hasn't worked. But uh, there will be another experiment coming up later uh, with a slightly different setup uh, where we see uh, this actually happening in the experiment. Okay, so conclusion is this Archimedean screw should work. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe there are some surface issues with the existing experiments why, why it's not yet uh, there. But now um, we have said we can move uh, the, the helix, but the story I, I told you was that anything with the Goldstone mode, anything with the zero mode uh, should start to move. Uh, so uh, let me just briefly show you uh, one or two examples uh, of other stuff moving, and then we go back to uh, experiments. So, um, the uh, prime candidate for, for pushing things around 
is a magnetic skirmion. So this is a magnetic texture which has this kind of winding number and, and which is um, seen here. And, and that's realized in, in all these systems where, where the helices are realized, they also have this magnetic skirmion phase when you go in a different part of the phase diagram, different temperature, different magnetic fields. So now we can ask, let's take such a texture and put it in an oscillating magnetic field. Uh, what will happen? Uh, and here's a little bit of a simulation. So what we, what I'm doing here, I take such a magnetic skirmion, and then we apply a magnetic field, which is oscillating at a frequency, uh, which is called breathing mode, which is actually a, a size oscillation of the magnetic field. Yeah? So the, uh, of the skirmion. So the skirmion shrinks and grows under oscillations um, of this magnetic field. So if you like similar that uh, here as our caterpillar here, which also changes, uh, which shrinks and grows periodically. And, and while doing so, uh, there's a net uh, motion forward. Uh, and, and message, if, if, if symmetries are such that this type of motion is allowed, so you should somehow break the rotation symmetry of the system by, for example, by here by tilting the magnetic field, uh, then this thing uh, will also happen. And um, yeah, and uh, indeed, now you can play the same game. It's actually much more uh, difficult. That that's a, a paper of Nina Delser, which was just uh, put out last week. Um, you can now calculate again analytically uh, the speed and compare to an actual simulation. So so points and and the blue points and blue lines are is is again simulation versus a calculation, and you find uh, this thing indeed moves. And actually, it moves by two different mechanisms. So when you hit the system at this breathing mode, remember this was the mode where your where the size of this uh, of this particle was oscillating. Then the mechanism is that you have this oscillation of size, and and that interplays with the friction, and and you get a friction assisted motion, indeed very similar to what the caterpillar is doing. Now. When you drive the same thing by larger frequencies above the Magnum gap in the system, then you get similar speeds, but by a completely different mechanism. So there's no resonant enhancement. There are nothing like that. But instead, uh, your, your skirmion now acts like an antenna sending out Magnons in all directions. But it does so in a non-uniform way. So there are more Magnons uh, sending out in one direction compared to the other direction. And therefore, uh, you get kind of a rocket propulsion mechanism which moves uh, this commune. Good. So uh, that was now all theory. Um, and, uh, and, and I already promised you that it'll also show some experiments. So here's the experiment. So the experiment is done on a, a common lattice. So, so these are these topological magnetic textures, but now arranged in a regular array. And what you see here, for example, is an electron microscopy picture of such an array of uh, magnetic skirmions. And now what you do is uh, you, you take a laser and shoot with the laser uh, with an ultra short uh, pulse let's say, short pulse of 50 femtoseconds, uh, you shoot on this uh, skirmion phase. And what you see is when you compare uh, before and after uh, a single pulse, that actually the skirmion lattice has rotated. Yeah, so, and, and, and here's the rotation as uh, you do one, two, three, four, five results. And then for each rotation, uh, uh, for each pulse, uh, you get a rotation by, by roughly the same angle. And uh, you can also study that as a function of the, uh, of, of the fluence, so the amount of energy you put in the system, and you get the expected behavior that first nothing is happening, but then uh, if, if this pulse have, has a sufficient high intensity, uh, then this thing uh, starts to move. So what's going on there? And um, and what? How is this related to the story we have told, we have looked at before? Good. So so what's what's happening is the following. So first you have to ask what is this laser pulse doing? 
And what this actually this polarized laser pulse is doing, it uses the inverse Faraday effect, which means from the viewpoint of the electrons, uh, this laser pulse looks just like a magnetic field pulse. And so, so it looks as if there's a uniform time-dependent magnetic field, which is which, which has amplitude 13 millitesla in this case, and switched on and off uh, on this 50 femtosecond uh, time scales. Now, what will this magnetic field pulse do uh, to the skirmions? Well, it kicks uh, the skirmion and it will introduce this breathing mode, which are the size oscillations of the skirmion. So that will be triggered uh, by this field pulse pulse. So this is the breathing mode we looked at before. And now what we obviously see is that these breathing mode oscillations, they activate a zero mode in the system. Uh, I, I am hesitant to call it Goldstone mode, but, but the zero mode in the system is a rotational mode. Yeah, and it should happen by the same second order process, uh, which we uh, have seen before. So how do we know that this mechanism, which I tell you, is, is correct? And, and the essence is, how do we know that, that it's the breathing mode who is the responsible, uh, who is responsible for this rotation? Uh, so that was done in a very clever way by the experimentalists. Namely, what they did is they split their initial pulse into two pulses. And they choose the first pulse uh, that that it's below the depending threshold, so that that the first pulse alone would do nothing. And then they were investigating uh, what happens uh, as a function of the delay of the second pulse with the rotation. And so the idea is the first pulse triggers this breathing mode where the size of the skirmons oscillate, and then the second pulse. Uh, if it's in phase, it enhances these oscillations, and then this will trigger the rotation. And that's precisely what happens. Uh, so you, you see this characteristic oscillatory pattern, and this uh, and, and whenever you choose the pulse separation to be precisely this frequency of this uh, breathing mode, then uh, then you uh, get this rotation of the uh, of the uh, of the skirmion lattice activated. Uh, so that's the ex unique and very clear experimental proof that it's these that this this one mark non which describes the size of the oscillation of the skirmion that this one is in charge of triggering the rotation. Now uh, we can also now make a theory and we do the theory for the clean system that's very important here and and we can do essentially the same type of theory that we had for our Archimedean screw. So what you one way to do this is you formulate a, a theory for the total angular momentum uh, in the system. Then you find uh, out that you get uh, two terms. One is a friction term, which likes to stop uh, rotations by friction. And but you also get a pumping term, uh, which is activated to second order in perturbation theory. And indeed, you can find a, a simple uh, formula for this rotation angle. Which involves uh, the so what you need as an input is linear order perturbation theory, uh, and then you take this linear perturbation to second order, calculate the certain integrals, and you get your pumping angle. Uh, and and this linear order perturbation theory that we actually did numerically for this case, and for that uh, you get a prediction um, of this pumping angle, which is proportional to the square again of the laser pulse intensity, which is the amplitude of this oscillating field. And it's also proportional to the square of the duration uh, of the laser pulse. Good, so let's uh, compare experiment to the theory, where let me stress again, the theory is for the clean system. Okay, so this was this two probe experiment. You remember we were shooting two laser pulses on the system and then seeing how it triggers the uh, the oscillation in the IQ that this time separation is characteristic for the breathing mode. And here's the corresponding theory. And you see, you get essentially the identical uh, result, same signature um, of amplitudes and pinning 
only difference uh, is that uh, that we never reach kind of the, the, the zero rotation angle limit. That's just because we don't have pinning in the system. So good news is uh, we reproduce precisely the signatures of the pump probe experiment at first glance, because there's something I didn't tell you yet. And that's hidden in this factor theta zero here, the normalization factor, which I put here. Namely, it turns out that actually our calculation underestimates the prefactor of these effects by six orders of magnitude. Yeah, that's a shock. Yeah, so we have ever something which completely fits as far as qualitative signatures are concerned, but uh, we made a mistake by six orders of magnitude in the prefactor. Yeah, so which means we must have omitted an effect which is many orders of magnitude larger than the effects which we take into account. And luckily we know what this effect is, namely, uh, within our model, all the terms came from the damping of the magnet modes. And, and damping in this, in this insulating material, which we are discussing here, is ridiculously small. Yeah? So it's kind of the damping constant is something like 10 to the minus 4. There's almost no damping in the system. And therefore, the forces from damping, which we described by our theory, are much smaller than the forces coming from the disorder. In the system. And so what apparently happens, but we don't have a precise theory for that, um, is that the uh, uh, that the that the dis the presence of disorder does not only prohibit rotation but also introduces rotational torques sim similar to our how the friction induces rotational torques. And they are indeed all of magnitude larger and apparently are responsible for, for this giant rotation, uh, which is seen in the experiment. Good. Uh, so, um, so we are kind of slowly approaching more the outlook section of the talk. Uh, let me finish this rotational, uh, the discussion of rotations uh, uh, with, a, with one uh, kind of uh, fun uh, simulation, just to show uh, that, that one can now do many things uh, with such a system. So, so, so the experiment was on rotating a scrum and lattice, but this rotation game actually already works when you just take two scrumions. So here's, uh, here comes the game. So I now take uh, uh, two scrumions and I just take an oscillating uh, magnetic field uh, in the B direction. And to make this more fun, uh, we modulate, uh, we, we cho don't choose a periodic modulation, but instead we modulate uh, it according to music. So here we take some back pipes, and here you see what's happening. I hope the sound is transmitted correctly. So, yeah, let me stop that. So what you were seeing, uh, hopefully seeing and hearing also, uh, was two things. So we, we had this size of the, so the music was inducing size oscillation of the skirmion. And that actually gave a net force pushing these two skirmions uh, together on the one hand, and on the second hand, uh, introduced these uh, rotational torques. Uh, and, and this was happening uh, whenever we oscillate, whenever we tune this uh, music to the right frequencies of our system. And uh, yeah, that's just a fun example um, of showing uh, what one, that, that one can get all types of motional patterns uh, when one looks at this interplay of, of drive and uh, these magnetic systems. Good, as I said, I'm now slowly approaching uh, the outlook sec sessions section. And um, I want to show you one final example of games you can play uh, to con trying to convince you uh, that this is a kind of a promising direction also for the future, even if one is not interested in making small machines and pumping spin or charge or heat. Um, and, and so the, the vision or, or, or what I want to discuss is can we now 
use these principles or similar principles to really create the analog of, of active matter in our, our favorite quantum system magnets and so on. Yeah, so what is what is active matter? So active matter is usually discussed uh, in, in, in when, when you think about the flocking of birds or what happens in the beehive, when you think about the motion of, of bacteria or microswimmers or whatever your favorite uh, example is. And, and we all know there, there, there are these marvelous uh, collective phenomena which you see when you see, for example, a, a swarm of birds. Yeah? And now in the context um, of our uh, of, of this talk, we can now uh, ask, can we have now active matter magnets? Yeah? Can you have active matter magnets? So we just drive the magnet somehow. And maybe we see some of these more collective, more complicated phenomena, more complicated than the, just this translational motion, which I was showing you before. Uh, so let let me show this in a in a kind of uh, concrete example. Um, and what I want to consider is a simple XY magnet, and uh, so no helix, uh, no skirmions, much simpler, just a XY magnet. And, and we do a similar perturbation as before. We just have an oscillating magnetic field, let's say, which oscillates in the uh, set direction, let's say, by some terahertz uh, radiation. Now, um, and, and the Goldstone mode in the system, uh, so we want to activate the Goldstone mode. Uh, the Goldstone mode is obviously simple rotation of the spins. There's no translation here, but just simple rotation of the spins. Now, for a standard XY magnet, uh, you can uh, immediately convince yourself uh, that that there will be no net rotation of, of these spins uh, because uh, by symmetry, rotation to the left and rotation to the right is, is, is the same. So we'll not get this simple activation of the Goldstone mode for free, which we had in the other examples, which we did. The system has just too many symmetries in this case when I put the oscillating field perpendicular to the XY plane. But this changes when I do an XY ferro magnet, yeah? so when I tilt uh, the magnetization a little bit um, out of the plane, um, in this case, uh, the situation is different. Then due to the presence of this oscillating magnetic field, I activate the Goldstone modes and I get a, a rotation in one direction for one domain of the ferro magnet, namely when there's a spin net uh, spin orientation up, while when there is a net spin orientation down, uh, I get a rotation in the other direction. Uh, that's not yet active matter. Yeah? So this is just boring activation Goldstone modes, uh, the story we had before. So this becomes active matter when I now think about what happens at a domain wall. Yeah? Namely, uh, how now no, domain wall of the ferromagnet of the of the icing magnetization set direction. Namely, now you have the problem of how to merge. And a rotation in one direction, and the rotation in the other direction at a domain wall. There's no simple way to merge that because they are rotating in opposite directions. Yeah? So there's a big conflict of what happens at the domain wall. So it's how is nature solving this, uh, this conflict? And here are the equation of motion, but let's not uh, do that. So let's let's just look what happens. So we get an intricate pattern, but what happens net is that you get a a motion of the domain wall either to the left and the, to the right. And in this case, it's actually spontaneously symmetry breaking whether the domain wall moves to one side or to the other side. Yeah, so first message is if you have a simple straight domain wall, uh, this thing will start to move. But let's go a bit more ambitious and let's ask what happens when we have a 2D magnet. And um, yeah, and, and and so what I'm showing you here is now a, a quench experiments. And, and first, let me switch off the driving. So we do a quench in equilibrium. So what we do is we do a quench from high temperatures to low temperatures. So initial state is some high temperature state, no long range magnetic order. And then I do a, a sudden quench to low temperatures. And, and then you get what you expect uh, you get. In the system orders locally, and uh, we get the formation of domains. So there's now one plus domain and, and one minus. It's a ferromagnet. It's an icing ferromagnet. 
So we get uh, these two domains uh, forming as expected. Yeah, and, and the fact that this Ising ferro magnet couples to an XY magnet in our model, that makes no difference here. But now let's do the same thing in our active matter scenario. Yeah, so now we, we think about applying oscillating magnetic fields and, and we couple it to this XY underlying XY ferro magnet. And then we know all these domain walls, they would like to start to move. Yeah, so there's much more this active matter scenario. And here, now you will see what happens. Uh, so it's the same simulation, but now with this extra term, which describes the drive. And uh, yeah, and we do a quench to low temperature phase. And what you have seen is now these domains, which have previously formed, they are magically, almost magically uh, going away. Yeah, so here's again the simulation. And now these domain walls are not only mobile, but they are actively moving uh, in the system. So it's not diffusion, but it's active motion uh, in random directions. And that effect is these domain walls find themselves very efficiently and we wipe out uh, the, the, the face. Yeah? And, and now it's obvious uh, that this will also affect uh, face transition properties, critical properties, all the rules of the game which we know previously from equilibrium systems are, are changed in such a, a active metal scenario. And that's something we are currently working on. Good, let me stop here. So uh, I told you a story on true magnets and, and one general lesson which you hopefully take with you is that it's super easy uh, to activate Goldstone modes. Yeah, we just do second order perturbation theory, we generically activate Goldstone modes, at least if there's not uh, too much pinning. And that will happen as soon as symmetries are sufficiently low in kind of any uh, system. Yeah? And, and this is a way to create all types of, of active metal scenarios from uh, Archimedean screws, moving domain walls, dancing skirmons, uh, whatever you like. And this with this Archimedean screw, you can actually rather effectively, efficiently uh, pump, charge, spin, and heat. And I think that's a promising direction for uh, experiments. A sidekick of the story was also to investigate what are further instabilities of this driven system besides this Goldstone mode pumping. Namely, uh, there's, there's quite some probability you get something like a Magnum laser or time quasi crystal. Uh, that's something which very naturally happens and, and which we also see in our simulations. And, and uh, so I hope uh, I gave you one example of an experiment um, with this rotation of scrum lattices, but I think there's a wealth of of uh, experimental observations to be done. And uh, one really unexpected thing is, so usually we are used that we make predictions and what happens in the experiment is much weaker, but here it was opposite. Uh, the, the disorder effects, which are usually your enemy, seems to be helping you here. And you found in the experiment a giant enhancement um, of, of, of these activation of Goldstone mode effects or zero mode effects. Uh, in the experiment, and my outlook uh, was uh, that there will be more fun with active quantum or magnetic matter uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Akim, for a beautiful talk and sharing your uh, fun simulations uh, with music. Um, so. Uh, the session is now open for questions, uh, so if you're in the audience, uh, please feel free to raise your hand or mute, unmute yourself and ask out loud. Uh, no questions. Um, I got a couple of questions. So uh, the first one is, I guess, it, it's pretty naive, but um, when you have uh, this uh, rotation, um, response uh, what determines the direction of rotation mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, the direction of rotation is indeed if you like is determined by an external magnetic field or um or you can also say by the winding of the uh, of these skirmions mm -hmm. uh, so so i didn't tell you much about the theory of, of magnetic skirmions but uh, the most fun part of skirmons is actually uh, that they act like a particle in a, in a gigantic magnetic field. And so this winding number of the skirmion translates into an effective magnetic field. 
And so, uh, so the equation of motion of a skirmish is, is that of a particle in a giant magnetic field. So there's a sense of rotation, which is naturally imprinted on that by, by this fact. And so there's a tiny external magnetic field to stabilize this, but but important is a is emergent magnetic field which comes from Berry phases of electrons in this case and the winding number which makes these things rotate. So this was not a skirmish talk, so I didn't I mm -hmm. put all this stuff under the rug. Um, and and in, in your simulations, uh, well, I guess I can go and read your students' uh, master thesis, but uh, <laughs> I, I have you here, so I ask you. Um, so, how do you create a single scrimion in a Fermat? Was oh, that in a simulation? Uh, right. That's not so. Uh, so, in a simulation, what you just do, you you just write by hand uh, the the corresponding texture. You know, you, oh, okay. you you write it just by hand, and then you let let the simulation relax a bit. Yeah. So the, the, it will All just right. you you have a finite winding number initially, and then you let it relax. All right. So you're you're initializing your system uh, with some texture, and then you're solving the LLG equations. Exactly. Yeah. You just switch on damping, let the simulation run, and then then it does the job on its own. There's right. not much of a. It's super easy. So uh -huh. these simulations are, are not not. There's nothing. No challenge in in running such a simulation is is super easy. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I had another question that I forget. Ah, in I, I guess in the in the in the last part uh, where you showed the disappearance of the domain walls, um, the domains, uh, the, um, the the which phase, you know, if the the which polarization will win will also be determined for by the winding number of. Uh, or, or no, no, that was just a standard. There is no funny number here. So, yes. so what, whether this ends up true or, 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 or red is 50-50. Is, is 50-50, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so that's just, uh, that was just an accident, uh, whether the one phase or the other phase. So th this was, so we didn't break the icing symmetry here in any way. It was not by the breaking, uh, not, not, nothing but the oscillate. So, so we were very careful not to break. That that would be unfair. Yeah? So that's another way to get rid of domains by, by not doing a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking. No, we we carefully kept the icing symmetry, so there's exact 50-50 chance uh, to have spin up and spin down. Yeah, and uh, and and you see this kind of most of the time you had 50-50, but at some uh, at some point due to the finite size uh, and as these dom Things start to shrink. Uh, ultimately, just one phase wins, and that's by accident which one is winning. But you see, it's very different compared to the equilibrium case because now these domain walls become active matter, which are actively swimming through the system, not only doing some some big diffusive motion or something like that, uh, but they are now really propelled uh, through the system in a very active way. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you can see there's a lot of games that one can play here, and you're having a lot of fun. Uh, so um, I don't have any other uh, questions. You guys, no, no questions. All right. If uh, there are no more questions, we thank Achim one more time for joining us today from Germany at this time in the evening. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I guess we'll see you again next week. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Bye, Achim. Thank you so much. <laughs>